contains ions which... Okay, particles with the same electron arrangement are said to be isoelectronic. Which of the following compounds contains ions which are isoelectronic? Okay, I've pulled the electron arrangements um, for the elements for, for, from here. Okay, so what we're looking at is sodium in this one. So sodium is over here. Sodium is 281, but it's going to go to 28 when it drops off that electron. And it is attached to sulfur. And sulfur we have over here. Sulfur is 286, so it's actually going to go the other way and it's going to go 288, so it's not these guys. Okay, magnesium and chlorine. Magnesium, 282, so it's also going to go 28. Okay, and chlorine, which is up here, is also going to go 288, so not this. Potassium, potassium down here, is going to go 288. Okay, and bromine on this side is going to go 2818. Okay, because it's going to go to krypton, so in terms of electron arrangement. So not that one, so we're left with, hopefully this is going to work, calcium, uh, 2882, so that's going to go 288, definitely, and chlorine, we've already said, would go 288, so D. A little bit of work, but okay. Which line in the table is correct for the polar covalent bond in hydrogen chloride? Okay, you could go and get the actual numbers for this. Um, I sh maybe should have pulled that from the data book. But what we have is that Cl has got a much higher electronegativity than H. In fact, sorry, let me just draw this around the right way for what you have in the diagram. Okay, so H and Cl. Okay, so Cl is a much higher electronegativity, so that means the electrons are going to spend a lot longer across with the chlorine, which means if there's more electrons on this side, this is the one that gets the delta minus, and the hydrogen gets the delta plus, which means just looking for the dipoles on this one, that's the one that works. Okay. Right, you can see I've pulled the entire electronegativities page for this one. Which of the following compounds has the greatest ionic character? So remember, ionics is where you have the biggest gap in your electronegativity. So let's have a look here. Cesium, um, reading this one off, is 0.8. So I've got a 0.8 on cesium. Um, and that's a 0.8 for cesium there as well. And sodium, sodium is a 0.9. Okay, and then I need a fluorine. So fluorine, again, just finding the right bit for fluorine. Why can't I find fluorine? Fluorine, fluorine, there we go, is 4. Okay, which it's, it's the biggest one. Okay, and iodine, uh, 2.6. Okay, so we are looking for the greatest character and the biggest gap. So that must be that. Your other way of knowing it, without you actually having to go and do the work on on the real work, although to be honest, in the exam, you would still check all of them. If this is your periodic table, uh, top right hand corner, fluorine, um, is your highest electronegativity. And down here, you've got your lowest. And not surprisingly, that's where cesium is. OK, so um, you can use either if you were in a rush. You certainly could use that one. Um, otherwise, I would definitely check your electron activities. Diagram below shows the energy profiles for a reaction carried out with and without a catalyst. Okay, so we've got a, a nice kind of potential energy diagram of this. What is the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole for the catalyzed reaction? This is a bit sneaky because the enthalpy change is from reactants to products. It does not, this has got nothing to do with that part of the graph okay that part of the graph stays the same regardless so there we are it's 50 and it's gone down the way um so it's negative 50. i must have chopped off the d for that one i don't okay it's the correct answer is the other okay um for question five um how many isoprene units are joined together to make a limonel molecule okay so you need to know even if you can't remember the other bits of it. Okay. Oh, I can't spell this. Sorry. Butadiene. Okay. We've got, this is 2-methyl-1,3-butadiene. It's an isoprene molecule. The important thing is here we've got but, so that's four. So let's have a look here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Actually, it must go one, two, three, four that way. And then this one, one, two, three three, four, that way. Hmm, it doesn't fit nicely. Either way, it it does fit to it being two, okay? Um, you can sit and work out which way around it was attached. 
Okay. E. Sorry, six. The answer is E. Um, the following molecules give flavour to food. Which of the following flavour molecules would be most likely to be retained in the food when the water is cooked? Food is cooked in water. Okay. So the important thing here is that water is polar. Okay. This is water's big deal. Okay. Uh, which means anything which is polar is likely to be pulled out into the water. And if we look at what we've got here, okay, you've got a polar hydroxyl in this one. We've got a polar hydroxyl down here. And you've also got polarity in this one with the carboxylic acid. But in this one, you don't have any of those. So that's why that is more likely. Okay, question seven. Which of the following reactions brings about the above change? We're going from an oil to a fat. So you're expected to know that an oil, um, if this is your glycerol, and these are your fatty acids coming out from them, in an oil, the fatty acids are saturated. Okay, they do not have many, many double bonds. However, if you have an oil, then we are expecting that we have occasional kinks in the chain created, that's the dodgy chain, but okay, um, kinks in the chain that are created by double bonds that force a particular orientation. So that would be like a double bond there, a double bond there. Okay, so with oils, let's go that way. Oh, okay. So with oils going to a fat, what we need to do is remove these double bonds. So to remove the double bonds, what we are doing is adding in across the double bond and we're going to add in hydrogen. So this is hydrogenation. Okay, if we were going the other way, it would be dehydrogenation and condensation and hydrolysis are not really got a lot to do with it. Condensation is if we were forming these ester links in the original one and hydrolysis would be if we were breaking the ester links. Okay. Okay, I put this one side by side just because it was taken up an awful lot of, of paper on, on the actual paper. Okay, question eight. The rate of hydrolysis of protein using an enzyme was studied at different temperatures. Which of the following graphs would be obtained? Right, you just need to know the curves. This is the curve for an enzyme. Uh, what you're getting here is going to an optimum and then the enzyme is denaturing. Okay, the other ones don't fit to temperature. If it wasn't an enzyme, what you'd also expect is not even a straight line. You would expect that the temperature curve would do that. It would shoot off. Um, because of your big bump change on a Boltzmann curve. Which of the following is a salt of a long chain fatty acid? Okay, so it's it's pretty much a straight KU to be honest on this one. Um, soaps are salts of long chain fatty acids. Generally, we're looking at a potassium salt or maybe a sodium salt, but potassium is the most common um, attached to your O minus. Um, and then your long chain. Hybrid molecule, a bit that doesn't like water and a bit that does. Okay. And emulsifiers, emulsifiers for use in food are commonly made by reacting edible oils with, and we have the following options here. And again, a little bit of KU. If you know it, you just straight know it. Okay, so on this one, we are looking at glycerol is your your kind of bit of it that you're going to use as your hydrophilic part, sorry, hydrophobic part, um, and your, no, I was right first with hydrophilic, apologies. Okay, and your chain is going to be hydrophobic. They are esters that you're making, so you're not, you're not seeing that that's what you are reacting them with. Um, and you need fatty acids to start making them, and amino acids have got nothing to do with specifically emulsifiers. They are the the subunit for proteins. Okay. <laughs>